Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis, and I am your host. The focus of this program is to show the amazing lives that people have lived and are living. The key word here is live. Everyone has a story to tell, and all stories are worth celebrating. Over the years, I've had read too many obituaries that left me pondering, why did I not have a chance to meet this person when they were alive? The goal of this program is to celebrate the lives of everyday Vermonters who all are very much alive and well. If you would like to be interviewed or know someone you think would like to be interviewed, please contact me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com and I'll, I'll take it from there. Now, I would like to introduce you to a special guest today, Governor Howard Dean. Welcome, Howard. Thank you. Good to have you here. Thanks. So, we're here to celebrate your life, and I'm sure knowing much of it myself, it's an amazing life, but um, tell us where it started. Uh, well, let me see. It uh, started, I, I am descendant of uh, a family on eastern Long Island that used to kill large mammals for a living. Oh uh, my goodness. Whalers. Wow. And uh, I grew up both in New York and East Hampton, Long Island, but before East Hampton it was so shishi that we had to move. <laughs> um, and uh, I was pretty privileged in uh, upbringing. I went to private schools and a boarding school, which I really liked in Newport, Rhode Island. I uh, went to England for a year on an exchange scholarship, and went to, uh, then went to Yale for four years, and it was during the 60s, so I. I read anything I wanted, didn't take any courses that I didn't have to, that were hard. Uh -huh. And then, uh, then I went to Aspen and skied for 100 days for, uh, for a grand total of $250 for the whole thing. My goodness. Poured concrete and washed dishes, which my <laughs> father did not think was a good use of my Yale diploma. And then I decided it was time to get to work. I had taught um, in the tough sections of New Haven. I, I, mm. I taught. Um, junior high school because uh, I thought I might want to be a teacher. So when I was trying to sort out what I was going to do as a grown-up, when I decided it was time to be a grown-up right, for a change, right. which in the 60s was hard, right. um, I, um, I thought about teaching and I knew I didn't have the patience because uh, I'd learned that while I was teaching eighth right, grade at New right. Haven. Um, and I thought about um, going to medical school because I loved sciences, but of course in the 60s there were no requirements of any kind in college, so I didn't take a single science or math course the whole time I was there. Oh, yep. It was all philosophy, mostly left-wing left philosophy, yep. uh, which, which the national audience will, won't be surprised about, but the Vermont audience will be very <laughs> surprised about. And, right. uh, and so I settled on a career in Wall Street, which my family had been active in for a long time. Oh and got a job, and it was very interesting, and I hated every minute of it, and I hated living in New York, and mm. uh, one of my friends had gone back to school and was trying to get into medical school. I thought, well, she can do it, why can't I do it? So I did. Wow. I went to Columbia General Studies and took organic chemistry and biochemistry and calculus and all the things I'd avoided all those years, and then I went to a three-year program, uh, and I was the token goyim at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which is an Orthodox Jewish medical school. Wow. And met my wife there, which wow. was great. Uh, yes. And then, this is, this is where I can't stand people who are successful and then they claim they did all the work and luck plays a lot of roles in this and like, nobody ever admits that. That's true. Uh, especially the more money they make, the less they admit that it wasn't all hard work. Mm. So. Um, my first bit of great luck, well, I had lots of luck, but my, the first bit of interesting luck that got me into politics, which I was always interested in, mm. um, was that I didn't get into my first three choices for residency after graduating. I, I, I signed up for three big city hospitals, yep. and I didn't get accepted at any of them. Yep. My fourth choice was the University of Vermont. No kidding. And I came up here and was an intern and a resident. And, Wow. And then I got very interested in Jimmy Carter. I always liked him. I always thought the Democrats were not going to come back unless we ran a Southern Democrat. And there was a woman named Esther Sorrell who turned out oh, to live gosh, yes. four doors down from me while I was living in the Old North End as a resident in some attic apartment. Wow. Uh, and uh, she was the chairman of the Carter campaign. And I worked very, very hard in the Carter campaign. Wow. And she uh, talked me into running. He, she and her sister Peggy, who was, became the chairman, of, I mean the treasurer of all my campaigns, mm -hmm. 
talked me into uh, going to New York as a delegate. And I said, well, I don't know anybody. I've only lived here for two years. And they said, call these 96 people and tell them Peggy and Esther sent you. So I did, and I got elected wow. delegate. And that wow. was the beginning of my political career. Wow, amazing. <laughs> Synchronicity <laughs> at work. Yeah, <laughs> luck, luck, right? Right. <laughs> Hard work, where did but that, luck. Where did that, the, the, the political instincts or the political interests come from? Vietnam. Uh, you know, in those days, yeah. most of your viewers are young, sure. too young to remember that we were all draftable. Yep. And this is interesting because it, it's why I came out against the Iraq War, because I grew up at a time where we had two presidents, one of each party, who just lied their teeth out, mm -hmm. and 55,000 Americans died. Right in a war that turned out not to make any difference. Right. Um, you know, right. Vietnam is actually an ally, more or less, today yeah. um, because they, of their animus towards China, which is a traditional animus. I went over to Vietnam. I did, I've done a tremendous amount of international work since mm. I left the governor's office. Mm. And in Vietnam, they would spend 20 minutes telling us about how they shot us from the sky and all this kind of stuff. We were going around to these various places. And then they'd spend 90 minutes telling us how horrible the Chinese were. Mm. Uh, because, the, the, you know, we were there for 40 years. Yep. The Chinese have been there for 900 years and extracting tribute every single year. Exactly. So um, any, but anyway, I was very much against the Vietnam War and then very much for um, civil rights which was I had two black roommates. Two, they had never been in school with a white person before, and I'd never been to school with a black person before. Mm -hmm. um, and so, believe me, that was quite a learning experience for both, for all of us. Yes. Um, and so that really got me interested in politics. Uh, getting rid of Johnson, who, I, right. other than the terrible mistake he made in Vietnam, was probably the greatest president since FDR in terms of what he Domestic did policy. for poor people and, yeah. and so forth and so on. Right. Um, and then uh, and then wanting to get rid of Nixon and um, and that got me into politics. I oh. went you know I went on the marches. I was not a radical. I, I, as you right. may remember from our political history going back 30 years, yep. uh, I've never been I've always been suspicious of, of ideologues but um, but I was very much against what was going on in government with two consecutive presidents lying to us. All right. So, so here you are in Vermont in, during, your res, during your residency, get hooked up with Esther Sorrell, who was the, probably the, the godmother of democratic politics. She had a lot to do with it. Because you know, there, there were no, you know, I think most people don't understand that for 109 consecutive years, uh, between, right. there was no such thing as a democratic governor. Exactly. So, no elected you know, official at the right. state level, basically. First Democratic governor was Phil Hoff in 1962. Before that, it was 1853. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> but, the, but people like Esther kind of she rebuilt, the, she, she and many others re the rebuilt, rebuilt the party. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So then where, so from that, you went to the convention that elected? I went to the <laughs> This is true. This is all true. I know it. It sounds like a made-up novel. I went to the convention in those days. I hadn't quit drinking yet, which I did when I was 32 or something. Um, so I went to the convention as a Carter delegate, and it was the year that Teddy Kennedy ran against Carter, right. who gave one of the great speeches ever at that convention. I remember that. Um, and so the uh, I was young. I was th in my early 30s, right. but all the Carter delegates were the old guard Democrats. From the South? And the, uh, uh, no, no, oh, from, uh, from, from the oh, Vermont oh, delegation yeah, yeah. were the old guard Vermont Democrats gotcha. like Esther and Peggy and yeah, all their yeah, friends. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Madeline Cunin was one. Yep. Um, and, and then the, Kennedy, uh, the Ted Kennedy delegates um, were all young. Mm. So I Mm -hmm. Voted all day with the Carter people, and then I partied all night with Rosie O'Grady's with the Kennedy people. <laughs> and so when I came, this is all true. When I came back, Mark Kaplan, Robbie Kaplan's father, was a criminal lawyer, but yep. Ro Mark was a lawyer, yep. and he was the head of the Democratic Party in, in uh, wow. Chittenden County, I mean, in uh, the state. And he called me into his office and said, you know, I, he, she said, he said, um, uh, the, the head of the Chittenden County Democratic Party is very ill and she's going to have to step down. I'd like you to, to take her place. Mm. And I said, well, I, I can't. I've lived here for two years. I don't know anybody. How am I going to do that? He said, there'll be an election, but don't worry about that. We'll take care of it. I said, I, I'm not worried about getting elected. How do I do my job if I've lived here for two years? I'm a resident at the hospital 
I don't know anybody. <laughs> and he looked at me like this, because I was an interloper, of course. And he goes, well, I don't know. I know you've only lived here two years, but for some reason I can't figure out you're the only person I can find that gets along with the Kennedy people and the Carter people. And uh, I knew why that was. <laughs> so that's what really got me. Go. That's what really got me into politics. Oh, that's interesting. And then I, my job was to draft people to run for the Senate and the House. I actually right. drove 40 you know, minutes in an ice storm in February to talk Dick Mazza into running for the Senate. Gosh. And he was there for 40 years. My goodness. No kidding. Yeah. Dick Mazza. That's another story in itself, yeah. right, man, for sure. Yeah. How was it dealing with your profession, being a doctor, and being involved in politics? How did you do it? It was great. Yeah. Um, it was terrific. Of course, the legislature is a part-time job. Right. So <clears throat> I, you know, I, I, and I saw patients on Saturdays, and I saw them at night, and the legislature doesn't meet Monday, so I saw them Monday, and it was, just, it was a practice that was just kind of getting started, so it wasn't like I was just bombed and having to see, you know, there were some empty slots. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, all the during the summer, you, the legislature doesn't meet. That's true. So, um, so I, you know, it wasn't terrible wasn't to do terrible. it. The other thing is my scientific background taught me a lot. Uh, it taught me not to be ideological. It taught me to look at the facts. And because, you know, in politics, people get right. all bent out of shape and they insist and insist. Well, there's a set of facts. And if the facts shows that much as you might like it, this is not a good idea. Right. That was very valuable oh, I bet. Uh, to me. Uh, the one thing that wasn't so valuable is that doctors, because we have so much power over people, we kind of sometimes tend to think we're a little bit more part, important than we are. Mm. And so you, I, I caught myself doing some things, you know, being, sure. being uh, a little more, um, I don't know, uh, full of myself than I could have been at times. Yeah, yeah. But that's a terrific insight, though, that you have at this point yeah. in your life. So you... You at some point ran for the house because I remember when we, you and I, had a conversation forty plus years ago. Yes, you point. you were on the other side, but a good guy, <laughs> a reasonable person at all times. I think people don't understand how polarized Vermont. I mean, Burlington was when Bernie first got elected. Yeah. The oh. interesting thing is here I was this Democrat, yes. and my wife voted for Bernie, yeah. <laughs> and I knew Bernie was going to win when the mailman told me he was going to vote for Bernie. I went. Mm. And it was a revolution, yeah, it which was. turned out to be much for the better because the guy yes. turned out to be a very good mayor. Yes, um, and he got some, and he got Mike Monty into politics, which who's the probably the best force in housing in the entire state of Vermont and has been for twenty years. Yeah. That's um, so there was a lot of good that came out of it, but you know, it was, the it was animus between the progressives huge. and the Democrats were enormous. Huge. Yeah. And when I first got here, the Democrats were actually more conservative than the Republicans. That's right. There were some moderate Democrats That's like right. George Little who were right. very good environmentalists, for example, and yep. the Democrats were more con socially conservative. Yes. Because this is really fascinating. The, the reason that New Hampshire is a, a Republican-ish and Demo we're Democratic is because the same people populated both places. Um, the, uh, the huge proportion of both states are French Canadian. If you look in the phone book, right. you'll see Bourbo. It'll be spelled B-U-R-B-O. But it, right. the, this is all, the, during the Depression, a ton of people came down from Quebec because the mills were all failing yep. uh, and the farms were failing. Um, and, and then Irish Americans and Italian Americans came to the, to the, uh, to the stone uh, cutting industry in Rutland and, and, uh, and uh, Barry and so forth. And these were all Catholic conservatives. I mean, they were liberal, very liberal about um, social issues, about in terms of uh, working people and you know trying to provide for old people and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They were very conservative about issues like abortion and uh, gay marriage and all that kind of stuff. Right. So all of what happened, the difference between the two states is really interesting. Vermont. Democratic Party became populated by people like me, young professionals who wanted to get out of the cities and come. Well, it's not that I wanted to get out of this. I, I was drafted, but but most people came here because right. um, they they wanted to have a different kind of life than the life that was going on in the cities. Right. New Hampshire was populated. The the old Democratic Party in New Hampshire was ref, or, or the old New Hampshire politics was populated by people who wanted to move up. To get away from taxes in Massachusetts, mm, so that they very different. yeah, so the, so their their Republicans are actually not crazy. It's just they're dominated by the crazy section of the Republican Party. Right. Most of them are just people who don't like taxes. Right. 
and our people were people who just wanted a more progressive right. kind of place. Many of whom ended up electing Bernie. Yeah, yeah. Bernie, Bernie had the most interesting coalition I've ever seen. And I've got some stories about him, which maybe we'll get to and maybe we won't, that are extraordinary. Because he had this coalition of working class people who were relatively socially conservative, and then the progressives who certainly were not conservative, right. and he put them together, and that's, what, right. and that's, that's right. how he won. Well, you were in the unique position again, though, being a Democrat, but from a different place than the kind of a long-standing I was, but here. you know, I'm a very loyal person. The piece of people who got me into politics were the old Democratic Guard. Right. All the, you know, the yep. descendants of French Canadians, Irish Canadians, so forth and so on. So I was, even though my politics was different, I was very loyal to them. Yep, yep. Okay. And I'm sure they appreciated that. I mean, I'm yeah. actually somebody who believes that Gordon Paquette was a good mayor. I mean, the, 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 the uh, marketplace is because of Gordon Paquette. Yeah, that's right. Um, there are also some other things like the Battery Street and tearing down all the, you know, the ethnic neighborhoods that were right. urban but, renewal. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, my, you know, I, I was brought into politics by the old guard and mm -hmm. I was loyal to them, even yeah. though I didn't agree with all the, the yeah. stuff that they were doing. I'm glad we could have conversations <laughs> yeah. during that time. Well, you, because well, you've always been very good at that. There were others I struggled yeah. with a little. Right. So when I, when the legislature opened up, um, there had been a, uh, Lorraine Graham had been a legislator for years and years, and she ran for the Senate. Right. And then there was a slot that was open, so I ran, which was a hard campaign because it was Ward 2. It was a re right. really progressive area. Right. And then, and then that launched you into a whole trajectory that um, um, ended up lieutenant governor and then governor. And, right. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> what was it like? What was, what was what like? What was it like to um, formally, you know, it's one thing to be chair of the Democratic Party in the city or the county and, and to go to be a delegate, but it's another thing to actually be an elected official. Well, Ralph Wright was the speaker. That was wow. an experience. That was Very an experience. <laughs> that was a really experience. Yeah. And he was actually one of the few speakers that's ever been elected by the minority. He had five Republican votes that supported it. We didn't have the votes to elect a Democrat. Wow. And he was just a master politician. Uh, he was very controversial, but yeah. he was a master politician. And uh, the, I was part of a group called the Blue Shirts, uh, which was bipartisan. And it was kind of like the people who came up. It was Gretchen Morse was one of them. Oh, gosh, um, yeah. I mean, there was uh, you know, there was about twenty of us, mm. and we, I guess we used to wear blue shirts in, in, instead of white shirts with a tie on when we, and we were sort of the, this group that Ralph really didn't trust very much because we were independent and so forth and so on. Yep. Um, so I ran for whip my second year as part of the blue shirt thing, and I won. Mm. I, I won out of luck mm. because Ralph upset uh, the supposed candidate for speaker by getting a bunch of Republican votes and therefore I didn't have a contest. I was running against the existing whip and he got promoted to oh. leader and so there was a vacancy and since we'd both been running for months, that's how I got into that. Um, Were you able to bring your, your kind of, um, your, your, I'm saying agenda, but your personal philosophy about what you wanted the state and country to be? Uh, a, a little bit. Uh, with Ralph, one didn't bring one's personal philosophy unless Ralph put a stamp of approval on it. So we did, I mean, I did, I, I introduced a bill once um, that would prohibit power companies from spraying um, plants on, you know, the vegetation under the power lines without asking. Right. Now, of course, it's been in place for 30 years, but right. it was killed by the old guard Democrats. Wow. Um, because it was, you know, I mean, the old Vermonters are very particular about land Leave rights alone, and things yes. like that. Yeah. And so I, I, I figured, well, you know, why wouldn't these people want uh, some say over whether their land should be sprayed? But they didn't want, to, want didn't like the change. Mm. And in those days, I think the lobbyists had a lot more power than they do today. They still have power, but not like it was then. Right. Um, that was killed by the Demo by Democrats, old guard Democrats. Yeah. But it's today is the law. It's been the law for That's 20 fantastic. years, um, and then um, and then then what happened was uh, we had one child, and I was living in an attic in, uh, in 24 Converse Court, which was about three doors down from Esther, which 
made life right. easy when we were all working together. Right. Um, and we had to move. We didn't have enough yeah. room. Yeah. So we bought a house in the south end of town, which I still live in today. Yeah. Uh, and I moved out of my district. And there were two right. very wonderful women who were uh, represented in that district, one of whom was Mary Velty, and I think the other, mm. I can't remember if the other was Joey Donovan or if it was somebody else that mm. was there. Um, and I wasn't going to, you know, I was the chairman of the party, you can't run against your own people, so right. I right. thought to myself, what am I going to do? Uh, we'd have to give up my house seat, because it was, right. and um, I, uh, I thought about running against Jeffords, which I knew I was going to lose, but I figured I'd get my name out there for the future. Yeah. I thought about running for the state senate, right. and then um, I decided to run for lieutenant governor because I figured the state senate is a really hard race in Chittenden County. That was when Chittenden County was one big, enormous, hundred thousand, hundred forty thousand, you know, constituent right. area. But Six. now they've split it up. Right. But at that time, yeah. it was Chittenden County, which was hard anyway, because it's so right. big and media sensitive and all that. Right. So I figured it's just as hard to run for the lieutenant governor as it is for the state senate. So I went to tell Peter Smith that I was going to run against him. He's a good guy, just yeah. courtesy. Yeah. And yeah. he laughed at me and he said, I'll kick your you-know-what. And I thought to myself, he probably will, but I'm going to do it anyway. Right. And so I announced, so fine. And four days later, Peter announced he was running for governor. Oh my! Goodness. So I was running for an empty seat, and there was no other candidates running in the Democratic Party, and I'd had a head start. So wow. luck, luck came again, again huh? yeah. Frank Sinatra. and I won. That was the hardest race I ever had, other than president. Who were you running against? Uh, Susan Auld, oh, and yeah. I was the minority whip, and she was the majority leader. Hmm. And that was, I think, that other than the presidential run, that was the hardest, hardest hmm. race. She was very good, and she was very capable. And yep, yep. Um, her daughter, I think, is still running the state chamber of commerce. That's the bishop. Wow, amazing! So now you're, you're lieutenant governor. <laughs> uh. So now I'm lieutenant governor. I get reelected a, f a few times, uh, and I, you know, I'm the lieutenant governor has the only job is to preside over the Senate, and you right. don't tell the senators what to do. There, right. uh, there's a president pro tem, which is the, where the real Powerless. power is, and that was Peter Welch. Yep. Um, hmm. And uh, I was elected to my third term, and I was thinking, you know, this job is, you know, really not what you want. Right. And I was right. trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And I, on August 14th, 1991, I was seeing a patient, because lieutenant governor is also a very part-time job. Yep. It's not even exactly. as hard as being a legislator. Exactly. And uh, this phone nurse knocked on my door while I was seeing a patient, which is unusual, because you don't you know, right. have yourself interrupted. Right, right. And she said, the governor's office is on the line. So I excused myself from the patient, and I went and took the call, and a very a quavering male voice on the other end of the phone says, I regret to inform you that Governor Snelling has died and you're the governor. Wow. wow. <laughs> I started to hyperventilate, wow. and I thought, if you keep doing this, you're not going to be much of a governor, so you better <laughs> stop. So I Wow. But it was, uh, and the place went crazy. The press came into the office, the, you wow. know, the state police showed up, and oh, wow. it's just it was insane for wow. about, uh, for, for a, you know, I had to be, I knew nothing. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, the governor and the lieutenant governor right. doesn't, don't, the lieutenant governor is independently elected, so they generally don't get included in the governor's, uh, you know, meetings and, meetings like, and all yeah, that. Right, so I, right. I mean, I, th I knew something about the law and something about what was going on in, in the legislature, right. but I knew nothing. I had to be briefed on the banking situation, which I knew nothing about. I had to be briefed on, mm. you know, a, and, you know everything. Everything. And everything. I'm, I'm just sitting going, <laughs> And it was August 14th. Wow. August 14th, 1991. Wow. You know, the night before, I was uh, playing softball with a state team. I worked I, in the Department of Mental Health at that point. And the governor came by, and he wanted to pitch for an inning. So we let him pitch for an inning. The wow. state troopers were there and everything, and he threw the ball, and, you know, he had a great time. And he said, thanks, fellas, and he went, got in his car. And that night is when he actually had the heart attack. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So now you're <laughs> governor. Yes. Wow. Um, well, I'll tell you one about? other thing that I did that was really worthwhile that I talked to people about all the time when I'm asked to give talks, especially kids. Yeah. So the first week was insane. I mean, it was just one thing after another that I didn't know anything about and that I had to learn. The first thing I did was go, 
I went to the media, you know, I went to the governor's office and, you know, there were the, his whole staff. And, and Just devastated. Devastated. Yeah. So the first thing I said, nobody's going to lose a paycheck. And I didn't, you know, I didn't fire anybody. I just I, I yeah. kept them on and, yeah. and, you know, they would gradually peel it off. And it was a gradual sort of change. Right. Uh, some of whom I kept for a long time. Wibbs Edwards was the chief of staff and she ended up being the secretary of natural resources. Mm -hmm. She was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, that was a smart thing. Well, to it was do. the right thing. To it do. was the right so, thing to do. Yes. Um, so uh, it was a week of insanity just briefed imagine. by things I knew nothing about. Okay. And so uh, about after about a week, I found myself in the, in the big office. <laughs> uh, and by that time, everything that Governor Snellings had been cleared out, more or less. Yeah. And I, so I had a piece of paper on my desk, and I thought to myself, and I was alone. I mean, it was the first time I had a moment to myself wow. for the week. And I thought to myself, you never expected this. What do you want to do with this? Mm. And I, I wrote down five things. And I don't remember what the, all five were. Mm. But the top one was universal health care. Mm. Um, one of them was straightening out the transportation agency, which I'd had a lot of fights with when I was lieutenant governor. And there, I forgot what the other ones were. Mm. Oh, well, the other one was preserving the long trail, which we did. And Mazza was a key player in that. Interesting. Um, and it was very valuable. It was a learning experience for me. I think it's something everybody should do, no matter whether they're governor or whether they're in their everyday life. And yeah. kids should learn to do this. Jim Hunt, who was governor for eight, uh, for four terms in North Carolina, 16 years, an old guy, who's sort of a mentor for us new people, looked at me once with these piercing blue eyes. He was about 75 at the time, and he said, "You know." 90% of what we do is urgent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, mm -hmm. and he goes, and 10% is important. Wow. And if you're not careful, you spend all the time on the stuff that's urgent and you never get to the stuff that's important. Mm -hmm. So I tried never to leave my office the days I was in the office without pulling out that drawer and looking at those five things and making sure I'd done at least one thing that day right. that was gonna further the stuff that was important. Sage wisdom. It's so easy to get yes. sucked into the urgency. Day and this, day. there's not, not a person on earth that That's that right. isn't helpful to. Absolutely Because right. we all get sucked yeah. into what's urgent and we forget about what's important. You know, there's a, an old saying, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up somewhere else. <laughs> and it's the same thing. It's yeah. that if you're not focused on what is important, you'll just get taken up by the events of the day. Wow. Yeah, well, it's that, easy to happen in especially politics. Especially in that office. Right. As governor. Yeah. Wow. So there you are. You're so going. there I am. <laughs> Tell, I want to sidetrack for a little bit because you did a lot of great work on the waterfront here yes. in Burlington. And I want you to tell that story. That was interesting. I don't exactly remember how I got into that. Uh, our, my companions in crime were uh, Tom Hudspeth, who was an environmental yep. professor at the University of Vermont, and Rick Sharp, yep. who's still active in a variety of things. I think he runs a waterfront yes. tour service yes. and stuff. And he runs a... a uh, a, a, a tubing, skiing. a tubing mountain yeah, up right. in Milton, which yeah, is great. Exactly. Um, and we all got—I can't remember exactly how we got interested in it, but we all found each other in some way. Rick, uh, Rick keeps giving me all the credit. He is the one that really deserves the credit. He was relentless and sometimes a little over relentless, but it takes all he, kinds he, to he get the lawyer done. too. He had a good, he, good head. Well, the story is unbelievable. So we, you know, we had this incredible old track, and yep. we had this waterfront that was a disaster. Right. And we wanted to fix it, and we couldn't get anywhere uh, with the, you know, the powers that be. Yep. They just weren't whatever. You know, we were. This was a, the old guard, right? Right. Right. And there was one guy, Morris Mahoney, who was yep. young, and he was at least willing to. So we'd go to the to select the city, alderman's meeting or yep, city council, yep, whatever yep. it was called then. And what was it the alderman? The alderman. It was yep. aldermen because there was only the one woman. Right. Right. So that was changed. Um, and uh, we, you know, there's a five minutes at the end, at yep. 10 o'clock at night when everybody's exhausted that public citizens can say. So we'd give the pitch. And Morris Mahoney would always recognize us, and then nobody else would vote with us except Morris. <laughs> so we kept going and going and back, and we couldn't get anywhere. And we did a few things. But we had this task force. We had, there was a woman who was 90 years old, I'm not kidding, Dorothy, and I can't remember her last name. Um, it might have been Parker, but I don't think it was. 
But she was an old lady who lived up on the hill, and she spent her time community organizing. Mm. So we'd have meetings in the North End and all over the place mm. with 100 people no that kidding. wanted this thing. Wow. And uh, they wanted a bike path. They wanted a bike path. The and there already road. was a small bike path up in the North End that had been paved long ago. It okay. sort of went from one neighborhood to the other along the railroad tracks. Okay. Um, so we just kept pushing and pushing. And Bernie wasn't too interested in talking to us initially either because we were Democrats. And as you remember, Bernie had not much right. use to the Democrats. Right. So uh, <laughs> I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it. So I'm old and I can get away with this stuff. <laughs> so, it's your life. But Bernie knew that it was a good and then, and then Rick uh, and I went to the legislature. The legislature was actually great mm -hmm. because there were a few advocates in the legislature, including some Republicans, who was a very influential guy, and I think it was Joe Handy in the North, who lived in the North End, who was scion of the Handy family. Right. And he was very interested in this, and he was a Republican and a big Republican donor. So he put pressure on the state Senate to mm. begin to look at all this, and then that's when the pub Rick found the public trust doctrine right. and pushed that in through the legislature. And of course, I was the chairman of the party, the Democrats, so I was pushing the Democrats and we were putting pressure in the legislature to recognize the public trust doctrine, Interesting. which was uh, which would allow us because some of this stuff was claimed by real estate developers, <clears throat> and yeah. it was a it, was, it eventually went to the Supreme Court, right? And they, who found in our favor? That's right. Anyway, I have to do this. I shouldn't do it, but I'm old and I get away with it. So Bernie Rick can be a little acerbic, shall we say, politely, <laughs> and he was going after. Bernie directly in right. the newspapers, and it was it was a mess. Yeah, and Bernie was trying to make, get some compromise with some of the people, but this was not on the top of his agenda. Right. So finally, Bernie then Rick kept putting it on the ballot as an advisory thing, and it kept mm. passing with huge margins. Mm. And so now Bernie was in a fix, mm. and he didn't. Bernie does not like being in fixes. Right. So and he's not a stupid politician either. Right. So he called me up. Uh, the phone rings in the doctor's office one time, and I hear this voice on the other end. Howard, I'm announcing in five minutes that I'm going to put a bond issue on a, on a ballot for the bike path, and you can call your friend Mr. Sharp because I'm not talking to him. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> but he did it. Wow. And that was the, really that the was beginning. It. And then the, the park where the barge canal is, this is terrible, right. but I think there's a statute of limitations. Rick had this talked to the construction guys. I cannot believe to this day he did it. He's a lawyer. He talked to the construction guys that were putting in the, um, the, the marketplace yeah. and had them dump their stuff into Lake Champlain off that spit of land, which has now become the thing that goes out to the boathouse. Because oh, yes. there was a park right. and we'd have 100 volunteers come down and we'd build little things and put bikes and, you know, little, yeah, you know, yeah, it was yeah. a, a makeup park. Right, right. And he had material, this unbelievably un against the law. <laughs> and he, he would convince them to come oh, down yeah. there, and then we'd all have 100 volunteers come down, and they'd have us a nice little brick path and some benches and stuff. Oh, my and that got all fixed, too, with Bernie's, wow. you know, with, yeah, when, yeah. The, when the money came in. And, right. and, and then Clavel did a fantastic job, and yep. he did a lot of the stuff down there. That, yep. Anyway, that's the whole story, the behind-the-scenes wow. story of, the, of wow. the bike path. Very nice. Thank you. And then every mayor has done a great job with it. I mean, yes. Moreau modernized the thing. And Dick Mazet gets credit because the governor, D Governor Douglas, did not want to put the money for the bridge in mm. over the Winooski River. Beautiful bridge. And uh, and Mazza said to Douglas, if 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 you don't put if you tra take this money out of the out of the transportation budget, you're not going to get a transportation budget this year. And that's how the budget. That's how the bridge got built. Wow. And then the Colchester resisted having the path tremendously for a long time. Okay. Mazza, of course brought them along. And, and one of the fortunate things, although it's turned out to be unfortunate in the long run, is uh, there was a guy named Bill McClay who was on the select board, who was a big biker who was unfortunately killed in a tragic bike accident when he was hit by a car. Mm. And if you look at the bike path today, when you get over the bridge into Colchester, Colchester. there's a bench in memorial for right. Bill McClay. So he had a lot to do with bringing this thing up into Colchester, and now you can ride to Montreal on the bike path. Yeah, it's fantastic. That yeah, it is. It's a and then when I was governor, bike pass was on that list. So there's one in Springfield. The rail trails started off. Is that, so that was one of your five? Uh, the rail trail. Yeah, the rail trails. Yeah. Uh, you know, other people oh, have worked are, on them since absolutely. then. But we had to fight the farmers because they claimed that it was their land. Well, it wasn't. And the decision mm -hmm. that Burlington appealed in the Supreme Court 
and one mm -hmm. was that no, that was still that was still yeah. rail land and it was public land and we could use it for that. Right. That one we made an alliance with the snowmobilers. Well, that makes I sense. Mean, yeah. You know, you, yeah. you think there's not much That's right. you know between environmentalist people and snowmobilers. Perfect. You know. We put a big alliance together so they can ride it in the winter and, and then bikers can wow. ride it. In the, and, and now some of the very conservative people who live in Caledonia County and all those places are yeah. glad to see the bikers because they spend a little money in the general store and stuff exactly. like that. It's been a huge economic boom yeah, it has. for the state. And I, I don't take all the credit for it by any stretch of the imagination, but that's how it evolved. Yeah. And then fortunately there was enough public support so that people... It just keeps going on. It keep going, yeah. yeah. Tell me about the, um, how important your wife has been to you over the years, being in politics like this. And, uh... <laughs> Very important. And she doesn't like politics. My, Is that right? My first, well, the first, I was invited to speak um, in, uh, uh, I, I think it was, uh, I can't remember who it was that asked me, but there was a delegation of people from someplace else coming, and they wanted me to, I, I guess I was the only, this is when I was in the house, mm -hmm. uh, dignitary they could get their hands on. Uh, it was a much more left than I, but people that I knew from, and they, so they wanted me to come down and speak about something or other that I knew nothing about, but that never stopped me. <laughs> so it was a beautiful summer day. Judy and I walked down to the place, and then afterwards we stopped at Ben and Jerry's when they still were in the, in the what's now a vacant lot oh. up on College Street. College Street yeah. yeah. And got a, a uh, actually, I think we got a crepe because that's what they started up yes. making crepes. That's People right. forget that they weren't an ice cream company. And so we're walking back to North Eel, you know, the Converse Court. And I said, Well, what did you think? She said, It was fair to poor with the emphasis on poor. <laughs> so, you know, you need somebody like that yes, to, you when you get so impressed with yourself. <laughs> it's pretty good to have a mate that'll tell you how it exactly. is. <laughs> that's wonderful. So she's, she, is, she was a sounding board for you at times, I suspect? Yeah. yeah, uh, she, yeah, uh, yeah. she was the, the ordinary person with common sense that I could talk to that wasn't sucked into my role and was not Im very right. impressed that I was governor, and that right. was important. Right. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And she's a doctor in her own right. Yeah, she just retired about three years ago. That's amazing. So we were in practice together with a, with a, a third person. Oh, okay. Wow. That's wonderful. So, and you have a son? I have a son and a daughter. And a daughter, okay. My daughter, Tell me about them. daughter is to the left of Angela Davis. <laughs> she is a public defender in Berkeley, California. No with kidding. One, one son who is terrific, the apple of our eye, of course. Mm -hmm. My son is, uh, and his wife are doing inner city education stuff in Philadelphia, and they have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. Wow, that's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. I think so. Yeah. I'm very pleased yeah, with yeah, him. yeah. Good for you. Good for you. So he, um, here you are now at this point. I know I see you on TV all the time. I'm a CNN watcher. Um, what what's what's the horizon look like for you? What do you want to do? I want to spend as much time with my grandchildren as possible yeah. and do what I can to resurrect the United States after the horror show that we had with when Trump was president. Yeah. Yeah. And make sure there's not another one. Yeah. Because I think I think Vance is even worse than Trump. Yeah. I mean, Vance openly espouses uh, uh, the end of democracy. Yeah. And that's, you know, why you'd pick somebody like that to be the elected vice president of the United right. States. I do not know. So, so you're ready at this point. I mean, we've got what 96 days before the election. Right. Um, so put the boots on and and do whatever you yeah, can. Yeah. I mean, out. I you know I do what I'm asked to do, which yeah. is. Not a lot. I mean, I'm yeah. not, you know, I, I, I've actually never met Kamala Harris. He's the first presidential candidate, Democrat, I haven't met since before. Uh, yeah. Lyndon Johnson I never met. Yeah. So well, let, I, you know, what comes to mind for me, a big part of your life was running for president. True. And true. Uh, we haven't even touched that. But, but let's <laughs> talk about that. Cause, and you did things that had never been done before in presidential politics. Well, that was a very interesting. Um, and what really happened was I didn't invent any of that. It was all the kids that worked for me. What I did was basically 
lay out. I, I was against the Iraq war, and here's why I was against the Iraq war. I, I'm basically a sort of a Hillary Clinton Democrat when it comes to defense. I do believe in a strong defense. Mm -hmm. But I'd also lived through two presidents lying to us and 55,000 Americans being killed because they lied to us. Right. And I was pretty sure, I happen to personally like George W. Bush, but he was lying. Yeah. And so were all the other people about Iraq. Yep. And the reason I knew that is I read everything I can that's in English, because I don't read other languages. And I read The Guardian and The, and the uh, Independent, which are British papers. For some reason, they can print stuff from MI6, the British intelligence agency, mm. um, much more easily than stuff from the CIA gets into our mm. papers. But the closest intel relationship in the world is MI6 and the CIA. So the Guardian and the Independent were printing stuff that said there was no evidence. This MI6 had found no evidence that Saddam had a weapons of mass destruction program, right. and there was no evidence that he had a chemical weapons program. And we were being told by our government that not only that were, but we were sending our kids to Iraq yeah. for something that didn't exist right. and that the government knew didn't exist. Yeah. I'd seen that movie before. Yeah. Yeah. And that made me stand up against the war. The Democrats in Congress, some of whom were running against me, all voted for the thing because they were afraid it would make them look weak if they... Mm -hmm. If they didn't. Mm -hmm. and they also all voted for Bush's income tax cut, which benefited the richest people in America and right. didn't help working people at all. Right. And so that's all I, I just spoke up against that. And it was a magnetic for it was actually like Bernie's races later on. It was just, mm -hmm. you know, the, the kids all came out. Yes, yes. So what they were the ones that invented this whole new way of campaigning which now I curse myself about it because I get 150 e emails a day asking for money. <laughs> but they were the ones that invented all that. Yeah. It was a magnet yeah. for kids, yeah. and the 20-year-olds invented all this stuff. And you attracted them to I your attracted campaign. them, but I knew nothing. People go, oh, you're the Internet genius. I know nothing about the Internet. I am terrible <laughs> at the Internet. But all these kids figured it all out, yeah. and they'd send messages out to people saying, skip the pizza tonight, send $5 to the Howard Dean campaign, and they would. Yeah. The most amazing wow. thing was I, when you're running for president, you, you're away all the time. Mm -hmm. and you come back one day every two weeks, and half the time you have to go up and thank everybody in the office because they're killing themselves. Right. Our office was in Burlington, right. or South Burlington, I think. Um, and then you want to spend some time with your family and your kids, right? right. So I go in to thank everybody in my, one of my two, one day out of every yeah. two weeks, and this kid who I didn't know who was working in headquarters, which was... It was the building that's sort of at the foot of the hill by WCAX. I've forgotten the name of the oh. road back there behind the shopping center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Um, and um, so this kid comes up and says, Governor, we'd like you to sit down and have lunch here in front of this computer with a, you know, and have a sandwich. I said, what? <laughs> but I was used to being doing what I was told by 20-year-olds by that time. So they, there was no such thing as an Apple computer with a... They right. had hooked a camera onto the top of some you know, computer, yeah. and they wanted me to give a pitch to people on the thing, um, wow. right, to raise money right. to people who were presumably viewing elsewhere. This is long before there was such wow. a thing as Zoom, right? Wow. So I do what I'm told. Right. It turns out that Dick Cheney, the vice president, was giving a $25,000 a couple fundraiser in South Carolina, and I was the opposite act. And we raised six hundred thousand dollars, and he raised five hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, <laughs> and I didn't do anything. I mean, <laughs> so it scared the hell out of everybody in Washington because yeah, sure. they, a, they didn't like my message because it was, you know, right. look at what Washington is doing again. Right. And b, as I began to rise in the polls, they got nervous. But the organization fell apart at the end. I mean, everybody says it was the scream speech. The scream speech was after the fact, and. Right. I, it didn't actually exist. It was a, it was a creation of cable television. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was 1,200 kids in the airplane hangar, and you, nobody, you wouldn't have heard it if inside the. That's, I right, mean, none of the reporters right. inside, except the TV people, wrote about it. Interesting. But that's not what killed it. Everybody thinks that killed the campaign. What killed the campaign is I came in third in Iowa, and I was supposed to come in first. Right. And that was just an organizational failure. And let me just be frank. I say things I probably shouldn't say. And I said a lot of things that I right. sh would have been better, smarter politically if I hadn't said. Yeah, so, yeah. you know. Did you, did you have uh, like political, uh, a little kitchen cabinet that you worked with? 
Yeah, but they were really disjointed. It was sort of a mix of the, my people that I knew forever and then mm -hmm. some Washington types who yeah. were Washington types. Right. And that was right. not helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, what an experience. It was an experience. Yeah. And then they're going to And then I ran, then I took over the Democratic National Committee right. as an outsider. Right. And they hated that, but it was we created the 50 state strategy which is which, which they sort of abandoned because Washington is basically middle school on steroids. They're smart, they work hard, and it's all about them all the time. And it's one of the reasons the Democrats have not done better. Because mm. I'm convinced that we represent the American people much better than the Republicans do. There was a, a mm. very famous military sort of the theorist named Clausewitz, German, who once wrote that politics is simply war by another means. It's absolutely mm. true. Yeah. We don't yeah. understand that. We yeah. think if we come out with some nice ideas and yeah. you know tell everybody what they should know, yeah. that we're going to win. Yeah. The Republicans are, have a top-down military organization, and that's why they win, even though they're a minority. So when they, like today, we have uh, what they talk about, four battleground states or six battleground states, is that abandoning that 50-state strategy as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Except the 50-state strategy wasn't really about battleground states in the presidential race. We need to have an organization in Texas, mm -hmm. and it needs to be in every town. Mm -hmm. And until we, we, and that should be funded by the DNC, which we started to do. Right. Um, and we're not doing it. Right. The Republicans have organizations in every place, right. some less than others, particularly right. this state. Yep. But we don't. Well, you're, if you want to, I mean, we, uh, when we took over Congress, when I was chair, we took over Congress, the Senate, and then the presidency in four years. Yes. And the reason we did it was not because the inside the Beltway people were so smart. They were recruiting people who could fund their own campaigns. What kind of crap is that? Mm -hmm. So we'd call up the Democratic governor of Kansas, Kansas Kathleen Sebelius at the time, yeah. and we'd say, who could win? And they'd say so and so. So we'd fund them, and then the DCCC and the Washington people would want us to fund somebody else. Mm. You know, I, mm. I just, mm. it was ridiculous. Mm. But our people won. Why? Because we asked the local people who we should, who we should sense, run. Right? And yeah. then we helped fund them. Right. So, wow. and, it's, and, and I don't think the Democratic Party has improved a lot since then. I do, because they, once I was lost, well, Obama set up a parallel organization, which was a really a big mistake. And then the DNC just became what it always was, which is an arm of the presidency. You're right. Yeah. Wow. Have you written any books or anything like that? Three of them, and none of them are all that good. <laughs> uh, I, I had one campaign book, which was particularly ghastly. Um, and then I had a, a, a book about, uh, then I had a post-campaign book, which was all right. <clears throat> Uh, and then I wrote a healthcare book, which I thought was terrible, but I went back and read it. It's not that bad. Mm -hmm. It ta talks about why the healthcare system is so screwed up and what we should do to change it. Um, uh, it was, it's decent. It's worth a read. Um, mm, but it's 15 years old. But I was shocked at how, how it, much of it's still true. That's a, given being a doctor, being in politics, our healthcare system being in peril, basically. I mean, Blue Cross Blue Shield is... Sounds like it's about ready to collapse here in Vermont. The faster the better. Yeah. It's, it, pharmaceutical companies are a big problem, but they create products that save people's lives. The, the real bad actors are insurance companies. They take tons of money out of the system and do nothing for it. Mm. I'm trying to get the hospital here right. to set up their own insurance company. Because then you have a system where wellness is rewarded. Our system is a sickness system. Right. We don't get paid, we doctors don't get paid unless you get sick. Right. The hospital doesn't get paid unless you get sick. Right. What we need is a system where you get paid and then you make more money if you keep people healthy. Right. Yeah. Kaiser does that. Kaiser's not perfect, but the money comes in and it's not allocated. Based. And yeah. these ridiculous fights between the insurance companies and the doctors, the reason there's no primary care doctors in this country is because one, it's too expensive to go to medical school. And so you can't pay it off with what a primary care doctor makes. Right. Uh, and two, primary care doctors don't do cardiac surgery, which is a big ticket item. <clears throat> if you had a system where you got paid to keep people away from the cardiac surgeons by having them see their doctors when they're 20 and 25 and 30, et cetera, et cetera, and make sure the stuff that sends you to the cardiac surgery department when you're 50 right. got taken care of when you were 20, that makes sense. And a capitated care system will... We'll start that. This is a whole nother show. Let's do that sometime. Well, that's okay. 
So, all right, so here we are, a couple of minutes left of our time together. What's your five things that you want to do? When you wake up in the morning, you write down. <laughs> you know, I haven't, I haven't upped the list in a long time. Uh, number one is grandchildren. Smart man. Number one. It's, it, it's the joy of my yeah. life and Judy's life. It's just, uh, it's just amazing. As the old Vermont saying is, if I'd known how much fun it was, I'd add them first. <laughs> uh, and they're great, and you know I don't have to discipline them. I can yeah, I can right. be bad, you can and, and but you know spoil them it was, and all yeah, that stuff. It's, it's yep. just great. Um, um, uh, and number two is this is a fantastic state. We are so lucky to live in this state. Absolutely. All the complaints and all the carrying on. We are. I, you know, I, I just want to live anywhere else. I yeah. wouldn't either. Yeah. And so I, I'm just you know I didn't. I worked pretty hard all my life doing lots of different things. Yeah. Now I get to walk on the bike path every single day and I or, or ride my bikes. My wife is a big bike rider and yeah. you know just even you know going to have lunch with somebody in Waterbury is great because there's Waterbury is transformed. There's all these yeah. great little restaurants and stuff like that. And yeah. Yeah. So yeah. and then I you know I have old cronies from Yale and stuff. I go see them. They were all 75 years old and Okay. Well, uh, I'm close to still some, still very close to some of the people I went to school with. That's fantastic. Yeah. So then, when uh, CNN calls you or MSNBC or whoever, um, what's that like for you? It's great because I used to have a studio in my house for a while. I had a contract with MSNBC, and then they canceled the contract, and then they had to come up and pull all their lamps and crap out of their <laughs> cameras. Now, I just put, go on my laptop. Yeah, that's right. It's just great. Yeah. So if they want, they don't, most of the time they don't want me, but now since there's a big blow up in the Democratic Party, that's why I'm on television all the time. Right. But after right. this is all settled out, it'll calm down. Uh -huh. But it's not a sweat. I just, you know, that's... type in something or they call me on FaceTime and I answer it on my laptop and that's the end of that. That's amazing. That's so fun. it's easy. It's, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It, it, technology is just phenomenal. It is and it isn't, Gary. I worry deeply about what's happening to our children. Yes. I'm very, yes. very worried about it. Yes. Because, and I'll tell you why. It, it, we can complain about the big you know, tech companies, and I do. I think that, that. But the real problem is human nature likes negative gossip. Negative gossip has always had a role in human society. Right. The Salem witch trials right. were the result of negative gossip. Exactly. The problem is what the internet does is it magnifies the positive but it na also magnifies the negative mm -hmm. and especially your most vulnerable years in the teenage years you are really trying different stuff out and it's a terribly unstable time right. and now they're exposed to all this horrible crap some of which for money. I mean, some of these companies yeah. have an algorithm to right. go after you your the, sort of the worst things that you're compelled to see yeah. and it's really bad for our kids so I you know, we're not going to ban the internet and all that, but there's, we got to do something because our children are suffering because of that. I absolutely agree with you. But something is the question. What do we do? Well, if I was so smart, but I, I need a yeah. tech, some, I need somebody who's about 25 to tell me what to, how to fix yeah. this because yeah. somebody my age is just. That would be an interesting task force. Uh, right. To put some smart young people together with some people of, with backgrounds like yours to figure this thing out. I agree. Technology got so far ahead of the mores of the country, um, and we're the kids. Are I mean, in some ways, it's. Oh, I thought initially I was my fourth book was going to be with a former student of mine, um, and it was going to be about how the internet was going to save the world because you got to have sure. friends in Iran and Moscow and all these other places. Yep. I'm glad I never wrote that book because <laughs> it, it. I right. think you know. Right. I mean, I'm. I, I, Look, human beings have always overcome the worst of us, but not without tremendous damage sometimes. And I just worry about that a lot. Well, we buzzed through our time <laughs> together today. Um, any parting words? Any any piece of wisdom you want to share with the audience? No, about? just you, d don't write me about all the things I've said that are going to cause trouble. <laughs> I've offended at least a significant number of people that are watching this. So. Wow. Thank you for coming today. I'm honored to have you, uh, Howard. It's uh, great to see you again for a little substantial time and it's been fun sharing your life. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Yep.